So I'd like to welcome everybody here. The group is about the size we anticipated. So my name's Richard Lupka. I'm the Crops and Soils agent in Clark County. Today we're in uh, Wood, I believe, correct? What I wanted is kind of just to kind of get you set for what we're going to talk about today. First off, if you were coming today to find out where the money train is or where the answers to all the pertinent questions are, that's not what we're going to do today. We, we want to talk about some of the issues in agriculture. Uh, there's a number of uh, agencies out there that can provide some assistance in for, for a, without a fee for things to try to help you maybe do some, some <coughs> financial analysis, that type of thing, or have other venues that can send you to to try to help you in your current state that your farm is in or yourself is in. <coughs> you know, one of the biggest things that drove me to this is in the years that I lived on the farm, I had three neighbors that committed suicide within a two-mile circle of where I lived. It wasn't always derived from financial stress. It could have been some other trigger, but there was always a trigger. And I think that's some of the things we want to just look at today as professionals and as farmers when you're talking to other farmers. There are triggers. I also lost a very close friend uh, that I knew very well to suicide. So it's kind of a topic for me that how did I miss this? How did I miss that? So I mean that's just some things that we want to talk about today. <clears throat> but we want the big thing we want to do is talking about taking care of ourselves. Where can I get some assistance if I need some? And I think that's the gist of what we want to do today. Please ask questions. I think all the speakers will say. Yes, please ask questions. Am I correct, John? Yeah. Excellent. Yep. Mike already yep. told me that. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Mike's already introduced himself. Uh, he's from the Wisconsin Farm Center, and it's an agency that provides a lot of assistance or can provide a lot of assistance to farmers and those related in agriculture. Right. Thank you, Richard. You and we are part of the Department of Agriculture. And so, as I like to say, we're the best kept secret within the Department of Ag. So we, uh, we do, we, we've been giving this presentation a lot this winter, and uh, even for the past, you know, past year off and on. But this winter, we've been asked to do a lot of outreach, as we call it, and do these type of presentations to essentially spread the word about the services and programs that the Farm Center offers. So with that, we'll get started. And I'll just, I'll just quickly, um, where the Farm Center is housed within the, the Division of Ag Development. And that is, you know, with, in the, in the Department of Agriculture, there's different divisions within the Department of Agriculture. We are the only non-regulatory division within the Department of Agriculture. You know, what we are mandated by state statutes. But some of the, you know, Allison Dairyland is housed in our division. Um, the Wisconsin Farm Center, Wisconsin International Agribusiness Center, and Wisconsin Ag and Food Center. Um, you know, some of the things within the department, within the Ag and Food Center are something special from Wisconsin. So anytime you see that little sticker, or hear any advertising or heard that mentioned. Uh, I know the lady, and there's one lady that heads up that program for the entire state. Um, farm to school, um, on farm to school program is still a program within it. However, the lady that was in that capacity initially, she left, and then we are probably a couple weeks away of hiring another person in, or in, in announcing another person to fill that position. Agribusiness and value added, ag business development and support. This includes like dairy, dairy processing and dairy development, um, primarily aimed at not the dairy farmers themselves, that's where the farm center comes into play, but the dairy processing and uh, dairy marketing side of the, that might be a touchy term today with the, with the prices the way they are, but um, you know, that's, that's a, one of the issues. And then also a lot of the specialty crop 
uh, programs that are held within, are all held within that department um, or that, uh, that center. And uh, then of course Alice and Dairyland and then anything that comes through the county fairs as far as market orders for any of the, the state boards like the corn, corn promotions board, the soybean growers board, you know, any of those cranberry growers board, all of those board of directors, ginseng is pretty common up in this area and to the northeast, further to the northeast. Those boards are all, you know, uh, ruled and, you know, follow DADCAP guidelines as far as running their boards and DADCAP collects any of the fees that are related with those different boards. Um, farm Center, why we exist? The Farm Center is here to help farmers, no matter if they're in the beginning of their career, they're in the middle of their career, or if they're in the end of their career and thinking about retiring and exiting and putting a sunset on their farming career. Um, how we came to be was in the 80s, in the last farm crisis, we were developed, it was, uh, there was a federal law that was passed and it was also supported by a state statutes in, a state statute in Wisconsin. We still operate underneath that state statute within the state of, of Wisconsin. You know, we were born of, in the 80s and, you know, in the last farm crisis. And are we, it, are we approaching another farm crisis? I think we're possibly in its infancy. Maybe others in the room would disagree. But, you know, one thing that the farmers have going for them today is at least the interest rates are more conducive to, you know, being able to repay the debt uh, even though the markets may not be, and the land values, at least thus far, have not started to decline. In the, in the 80s, the land values were not a decline, it was a crash. Because interest rates were at their highest levels they've been likely in history, and um, you know there weren't any buyers out there for the land. Everybody was paying the same interest rates. You know, that limited the the buyers of the people that were able to buy the land. In today's market, that's not quite, the, you know, we're not quite in that scenario. And ultimately, we're in the, the Wisconsin Farm Center's mission is to keep farmers farming, or if, if we see that the viability and the long-term viability is a real issue, we ultimately will try to help that farmer decide how to gracefully exit and preserve their equity that they have. As I mentioned, it's a broad mandate under state law. The Farm Center does have to abide, abide by the state privacy laws. So everything you discuss as a, as a farmer, everything that's discussed with us stays confidential. Now we do work with your lender, whoever that may be, and to get your authorization to release the financial information because without the financial information, we have no idea where you're at from a viability standpoint or from an equity standpoint. So we need to be aware of what your equity trending has done and what your cash flow trend has done. You know, we do, you know, we do to help spread our name around, we do programs such as this, working with Extension, working with um, FSA offices across the state and giving programmings at their local, local and regional and state level meetings for staff and or for growers. And we also get calls in from bankers to do programs regarding financial planning and transition planning. And we're an objective third party with an independent view. Um, some of our other services, as I you know, mentioned that we do have specialty crop organics and grazing. We have a herd-based diagnostic program. And I'll get, touch on these all in, in a little bit. We have 
What I do myself is I'm more involved in the financial analysis in helping farmers transition to the next generation or to transition to the point where they've got su sufficient retirement income to help them in their retirement years. Uh, this is Angie Sullivan. She works next to me. Um, we all are in a cubicle uh, set up within the Department of Agriculture in our, in our area. Um, the cubicles allow for us to have really good communication between all of us. So we generally, if we have a call from somebody that's on the line, we generally will take a couple of minutes to at least give an overview on, a, on, a, on, a, on the level that, hey, this is what I would, this is this purpose of this call, this is the individual's name, and there's only three of us or four of us that work in that department, so it doesn't go any further than the four of us. And, but she's, she is a certified organic uh, inspector, so she can assist any organic dairies that you may have in this area. She would be able to help you assist with paperwork, and anybody that calls in and either they're an organic dairy or an organic crop producer, we refer them right to Angie because she understands the organic side of things so well. You know, she did operate her own CSA over in the northwestern part of the state prior to coming to DATCAP. And she worked for Moses too. Um, herd based diagnostic, this is a program that's really underutilized. We have one uh, staff veterinarian that's a non regulatory veterinarian. And he actually will come out to the farm to do an assessment and a comprehensive evaluation of, and to give you ideas of where he thinks you can make improvements. And he'll tell you if he thinks everything is going well and you don't, there aren't any areas that he can think of that, are do, that do need improvement. But they, they'll, take, they'll do a nutrition work They'll take the Pennsylvania shaker box and, and establish your feed and what the length of your feed chop is. And, you know, they'll, they're very comprehensive. They'll do body scoring on the cows. They'll watch your milking procedures. They'll take a uh, part of that program. And it's all, again, no cost. Does involve, you know, they'll take bulk tank samples. Uh, so they do a very comprehensive evaluation of the milking protocols, the feeding protocols, uh, your young stock facilities, and your cow comfort in the, in the free stall or in the stanchion barn. You know, diagnosis of subclinical health issues, but that's all part of the, uh, that's all part of the diagnosis and, you know, helping with the bulk tank cultures and that type of thing. You know, they'll do ketosis scoring on the hoofs. Headline from, you know, this is all very familiar to all of us in today, right? You know, milk surplus causes concern, larger farms drawing scrutiny, farmers struggle with rising costs. I'm having trouble with this clicker. That was a, that was a headline in the Monroe Times 40 years ago. So things do, you know, Dairy and all of agriculture is a cyclical market. You know, so we're just in a down market right now. Now, unfortunately, what I see is, especially in the milk prices, you know, we're seeing wider swings. You know, it's not like a dollar or two or three like it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Now the dollar range is five to ten dollars from where we were in 2014 where we were at a high of about 2450 a hundred weight. Today, you know, or at the end of 2017, we were at a high of about 1650 to 17. These are the three of us that work. Frank is the elder statesman. He's our mentor that we look to for a lot of transition assistance. He knows a lot. He was 30 years in ag lending. I myself have 20 years in ag lending. But these are the uh, things, you know, this just touches on some of the areas that we can provide assistance for you as a farmer or 
even if you want to refer farmers to us, for those of you that are with FSA or an extension, these are the, some of the, pro, these are the um, program assistance that we can offer. You know, in estate planning, we don't draft any of the documents. There aren't any of us that are accountants or to f calculate the tax implications or that are attorneys to calculate the, or to draft the actual documents. What we do, what, how I see and how we perceive our role is to just help you get started. A lot of the farmers don't have a clue and have no idea where to turn to when they start entering and want to, they have a son or daughter that wants to come into the farm. So we just try to help them through that process to give them some background, give some, them some knowledge on where to go to look for the resources to help them get started in this process. You know, we have a packet that's like 22, 23 pages that we go through just to cover some of the issues involved in transition planning. You know, and transition planning, succession planning, you know, that's one and the same that all is encompassed in the estate planning for the outgoing generation, or in other words, the retiring mother, father. You know, we do assist with that as well. Um, we also can talk a little bit about how to avoid your, you know, Medicaid recovery and uh, preserve your equity and some of the eligibility issues that may come along with Medicaid assistance. Um, by, as I mentioned previously, the viability and the profit analysis is at no cost services. Uh, we do do a little bit of debt restructure as part of our rev uh, financial review. We will look to see if they, we believe there are any options for you to either restructure your debt. However, most lenders have been very good in, you know, about uh, offering restructuring to their clients, you know, in the past few years. You know, well, that's kind of limited you know, they're kind of limited in what they can do in the, at least for the next year or two or more. And as, so that kind of handicaps us as well. You know, it does limit ours because there's been so much restructuring done within the last two years. You know, a lot of the accounts that I talk to and that I'm working with as far as my caseload, a lot of those accounts, you know, that has come up, you know, well, can I restructure? And I said, well, you know, I can look at that, but if, you know, when was the last time your bank did a restructure for you and put some of your accounts payable either on your intermediate debt or your long-term debt? And they said, well, we just did that three years ago or two years ago, you know? And I said, well, they'd like, you know, the lender isn't gonna be very receptive to having to do that again if they just did it. So unfortunately, that's the economics of where we're at in today's market. Um, we do do minor cash flow analysis for expansions, contractions, and for retiring farmers. You know, and again, the retiring farmers, beginning farmers, that gets into where we really want to analyze the, 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 the income and expense side of the, the financial information to offer, you know, to see what the long-term viability is. And also we do the long-term, you know, we do analyze the balance sheet and determine how much equity there is. The real common uh, expression today in, as far as the equity side, is how much equity are, do we foresee that you have the ability to burn, you know, or, to cover your losses in the next year to two or three years going forward. And again, part of our approach is see it big, keep it simple. Um, you know, the best indicator of the future is past performance of the operation. You know, well, that's why we like to have a three to five year trend and look at your three to five year tax returns or information that your lender can provide to us. 
and you know if uh, some lenders if I see a few lenders are in the here they're familiar with web equity manager um, with uh, FinPAC or a lot of the uh, uh, tech colleges they'll use the FinTAC FinPAC program all of those are analytical resources for the number side of the game to give to do a lot of the, the number crunching for us. Big thing is, especially in tough times, communicate with your lender. You know, I can't emphasize this enough. You know, be sure you know your own numbers and that you work through a cash flow before you even meet with your lender. I know FSA does a good job of this and um, there's some lenders out there that will ask for uh, you know, for instance, a 2018 or a 12 month cash flow on based on, you know, based on current <coughs> prices. You know, but a lot of times farmers are re reluctant to do that because they know it, they know it might not look good, but the lender already knows or is likely to know where you're already at and that you may have some struggles ahead of you in the, in the year. So the more the two of you can communicate on those struggles, you know, the better your relationship will be and the better off you may be in the long run. Because he'll be able to help you more in the future. You know, develop repayment plans, arrange for credit in advance. Well, this is just part of the planning before you go in to see your lender, not just walking in the door and say, hey, can I have a loan? I'm want to go to an auction tomorrow to buy some cows. You know, I sat in that on the other side of the desk from you and oftentimes that was, you know, there wasn't a lot of planning done. And in those cases, you know, we have to delay the process possibly because we're not in a position, there's no line, there isn't a line of credit that we can pull, draw off of to extend, extend those dollars immediately you know so that's that's part of the that's part of the reason why I emphasize you know the planning and I know this time of year it's you know getting on the later side to do that planning you know but that's why when you're working with your tax preparer and you're getting your numbers ready for the tax preparer it's important to kind of okay take you know take the next step and to develop a, a plan going forward or at least have an idea what am I going to need for equipment what am I going to need to cover my operating costs you know if if at all so those are some of the things you need to think through in manage your risk well you know there's I had a conversation with a guy on the way up this morning that we you know you can you can lock in, or I should say yesterday this was, you can lock in prices, but you know, as far as milk is as far as milk is concerned, there aren't a lot of opportunities in the mar milk market now because if you're operating at under your cost of production, or if you're getting going to be getting paid, excuse me, under your cost of production there isn't a lot of incentive for you to try and do any forward marketing unless you're going out but the cost of production is key that's where we also will do uh, for dairymen a break even cost per hundredweight you know it's an estimated it's not what the university likes us to likes to see done but at least we can get a quick assessment of what your cost per hundredweight uh, is and I, I like to do it from an operating standpoint because oftentimes when you hear operating, you know, or production cost per hundredweight, oftentimes what you hear is it's from the operating side. But we also take the next step and say, well, if you don't have any off farm income or if you do have off farm income, how does that impact your cost per hundredweight? The other thing is, is we include the repayment, the principal repayment portion on there because you know that amount of those dollars produced from the cows have got to go toward the reduction in your principal payment for the next 12 months. 
So we do it looking at it from two ends, and we call it fixed cost and operating costs. You know, red flags, we can, you know, and a lot of these are pretty common, you know, but high usage of credit card debt. Uh, had a call from a lady a couple weeks back. I've got her financial information. Um, she said, we're using, my credit cards are all maxed out, and we're using the credit cards to support our family living. You know, I don't know what to do, you know. You know, and those are, unfortunately, they're very sad situations because at that point there isn't a lot that we can do for them, you know, to try and, other than maybe give them, we do have an, an attorney's list and give them some of those attorney's numbers in their area so that they can maybe at least try to have either a, a credit, um, try, drawing a blank on the name, but you know, like credit counselors negotiate for you on your behalf or an attorney negotiate for you on your behalf to try and get those credit card payments, you know, reduced so that you're able to cash flow them. You know, unf the unfortunate side on that is as soon as they, as soon as they write off any debt, that affects your credit score. You know, frequent requests for extensions of payments, you know, well, those go into the lenders and there again it gets back to the planning, you know, and, you know, if you already know going in that you're going to have a tough time, you know, it, you might be a little more prepared if the lender does say no than walking in there and thinking you're just going to get the money because lenders have examiners looking over their shoulders and examiners are tightening up and banks themselves are also tightening up on their, you know, pulling in the reins. They're not as aggressive looking for, you know, they're not as aggressive looking for new business. You know, they're pulling in those reins because they know that the, that the environment out there is not conducive for profitability and they know that they've got to keep the health of the bank as one of their foremost, you know, the financial health of the bank as one of their foremost objectives. You know, otherwise they won't be with the bank very long. Um, far, other farm center services, mediation, counseling. Uh, we do have livestock and meat consulting, and again, that largely the guy that's in that position works with the meat processors, and then I'll wrap it up. And but first, mediation, and I do have some brochures in the background in the back. I don't have. I have brochures um, that re that refer to our counseling program that we offer. You know, we do offer counseling vouchers. And I was on the phone with an individual this morning, and he would like me to send, he's got about 200 cows, he would like me to send some counseling vouchers out to him. Uh, I was also on the phone with a, for about an hour with an individual earlier in the week that has about a 350 cow dairy. Very well established dairy, but he's, he said, I don't know where to turn. We don't have enough money from month to month to pay the bills. We've got this long-standing history. We've got a good, you know, we've got good registered cattle. We've been able to, fortunate enough to be able to sell embryos and our breeding stock over the years. And he said, I just can't come up with enough money and it's really getting to me. He says, you know, I don't know where to turn. And we get a few calls like that probably once every week, if not every other, once a week or every other week, certainly, we get a call from a really distraught farmer. Um, but you know, again, the mediation program, that's no cost of participants. That's uh, somewhat, of, a little bit of that funding comes from the state funding, but a large part of it is that uh, federal, the USDA grant 
And again, that gets back to when farm centers across the nation were established in the eight, 1980s. This program came along with that, with that mandate. Um, I know one thing is if you're an FSA borrower, when you get that, if you do, if you're unfortunate enough to get a denial letter, there are three steps in that denial letter that are pointed out. It's reconsideration and mediation is the second step. You know, so FSA has to offer mediation to any borrower that they turn down or deny. And one thing about the mediators that we used, they are all professionally trained. Some of them are retired attorneys. Some of them are retired UW Extension personnel. Some of them are, you know, the majority of them actually have their own counseling shop and they will, they will work with and mediate through between lender or we can even mediate family disputes we can mediate um, landlord-tenant disputes. So that's it. when I say mediation, it's more, more than just lender mediations. It does cover a wide gamut. You know, I don't know a lot about the program other than to address it here. We have one guy that specializes in our office. He works with and fully coordinates the mediation program. Counseling, we do, as I mentioned, we do have counseling vouchers. I did bring some pamphlets along that address that program. So if you want to look for the counseling vouchers or counseling, um, you know, information pamphlet that's in the back, uh, help yourself. Um, and the counseling services that are offered through that voucher program are spread or spread across the state. So no matter what area of the state you live in, within probably 30 to 60 miles, there should be a counseling agency that will work with you that accepts our vouchers. And just a lot of times the counseling sessions are just to have uh, someone that you think that will just listen to you. And that's part of what we do at the Farm Center. These are trying times for any call that we get. You know, and we understand that a lot of times I've had people say, well, thank you, I just needed to vent or I just needed to talk to somebody that has an understanding of what I'm going through. And that's a lot of the value that I see that, our, that our, the Farm Center does offer. This is Jeff, you know, with the Livestock and Meat Consulting. He works a little bit with uh, the producers directly, um, but largely he works with the meat processors. You know, the expansion in farm management plans, like I said, he works uh, on a limited basis with producers. Um, most of the producers, they might have access to extension personnel or consultants within the industry. So he doesn't do a lot of that anymore, but he will go out on farms and visit with farms, especially if they are looking at transition from maybe a beef feedlot to a cow-calf or vice versa, or if they're looking at converting from a, a feeder operation to maybe going grazing. You know, uh, grass-fed beef is re very popular right now, so he works with a lot, of, a lot of those producers that are converting and going to gra more grass-fed. All right, that wraps up my part of the program. And, you know, there's our helpline number. I believe all of the uh, folders that you have have our little, it's a quad, it folds out to a pamphlet size. Uh, it looks like they hung them right over the front there. Yep, that's that's it. So, any questions? Anybody have any questions or comments about the Farm Center services? All right, thank you very much.
So I'm going to talk today, and I, I do know that I'm being recorded. I'm going to maybe be a, a little bit less candid than I often am. I've been doing this presentation a lot throughout the state of Wisconsin, a little bit in some of the other states. I'm going to talk about supporting farmers and also supporting yourselves during times of stress. I'm going to move very quickly. Um, Mike, I know you've been at one or two, or maybe one or two of these, and I often have gone either way from 45 minutes to as much as like an hour and a half or so. So I'm going to compress things quite a bit. If I get moving too quickly, please stop me. I'd like for this to be informal. I would love for you to be able to share stories. At the same time, I know that in sharing stories, it's a little bit sensitive because some of the things I'll be talking about are maybe very personal. The one thing that I would like to share that is personal, a lot of what I've learned is from my 30 plus years working with Extension. Um, when I worked in Minnesota, I worked a ton across our different program areas. So back in the late 1990s, we had people working from our family living program on stress and change and grief and looking at family dynamics and like how families react during times of loss and, and those kinds of things. Traveled at that time in the 1990s throughout about 34 states. Actually worked very closely for a few months with Dave Williams's brother, Roger Williams, probably back in like 98 and 99. So my experience in this goes back fairly far, but it goes back even further because my parents, when I was uh, about 18, 19 years old, I went away to school. I went to school at Purdue in Indiana. Um, I actually am from Indiana, not Minnesota. I don't know if you know that. Um, I went to school at Purdue, and I was a young college student like a lot of my friends and colleagues down there. And if you probably remember back, uh, Mike, you talked about 1978, um, the farm crisis back then, 78, 79. I graduated from high school in 79, 80, 81. I don't know if you guys remember this. Some of you probably do. Interest rates were just out the roof. Huge amount of... Uh, uh, insecurity and uncertainty. We had grain embargoes and back when I was a student we had the PIC program. It, things were just kind of wild and crazy. And my point on that is I'm away at school. I've got three little sisters at home. I'm having a, the time of my life partying and stuff like that. My parents however really struggled through that. My dad had invested in land when because when times were good it looked really positive we also were beginning to expand so we needed some more machinery and they really had to deal with a lot of these things and they're, they they dealt with it in a way that I'll be talking about here today they reached out they connected because I had these three younger sisters at home they were very connected to the school to the church my dad reached out when he needed to to attorneys and consultants it was mainly cash grain so obviously with his, with his banker and his lending officer and even our local legislator, they took, took charge, they remained a couple, they remained strong, they made sure to keep the family together and they knew what was the most important. And in the end, while they did struggle through it quite a bit, they did make it. Uh, actually, both of my parents are still around. They just got back from Phoenix, Arizona last week. So over this next weekend, I'm excited to go see them. Um, but, th but they did, for, for me, things, they were a role model, and I really do appreciate that, um, the, what I learned from those experiences. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to go through some brain science stuff really fast. This has kind of be, uh, been what some of my talk has been, I, don't wanna, I haven't gotten famous for it or anything like that, but, I, but people have been talking about this talk. I'm going to talk about it from a brain science perspective because I think it's important to understand what happens in our brain and how does that connect to the rest of our body? How does that connect to decision making? How does it connect to this idea of chronic stress? So when people begin, begin to become depressed or develop depression or we have increased risk for suicide, a lot of that is about chronic stress. And then I also want to talk about things that we can do as like helping professionals. I know some of you are also farmers yourselves, some things you can do with yourself. The other thing I wanted to say, and Mike, I'm not sure, I think you might have touched on this just a little bit. Our whole, our whole community, or Richard did actually, our whole community is affected by this. So even those of you who are working in extension or FSA or the Farm Center, 
we're dealing with stress too, right? You're hearing a lot of stories. You take this stuff home at night. There's a lot of it you don't have a whole lot of control over. And so you also, I think, need to take this stuff to heart. And, and some of the behavioral things I'll talk about can be helpful for you. Uh, again, a lot of the work I've done is with helping professionals. Um, what I wanted to just emphasize, and I'll move back into my spot here in a second. What I, what I want to emphasize here is the idea of turning down the fountain. And when I talk about the fountain, in our bodies, because of things that happen in our brain, we begin to produce a fountain of hormones and other chemicals that influence a whole bunch of systems in our body. They affect, well, I'll, I'll come back and talk about some of those impacts in a second. But if you were visiting this fountain, presumably in some, I got this from Wikipedia, presumably in some European country, and somebody said, oh my goodness, there's an emergency. Somebody has lost something in that fountain. What's the first question you would ask? First question I would ask is, where, okay, how do I turn it off? How do I begin, like, like I, can't, I don't want to wade in there with it like that. I'm going to have a hard time seeing. And with stress, it's like, where, where is that lever? Or another way to look at it is, if you're talking about like a tractor or some piece of agricultural machinery, like this old John Deere 4020, where's the throttle? Where are those levers we can use to, to power down or to turn the fuel down? Or in this case, where are the levers that we can use to turn down the flow of cortisol is one of them. Another one is adrenaline. And we'll get to that. This stuff is real. Um, I just, I ran out to my car just a moment ago. Richard, that's why I asked you for the password. Um, this is actually a sale bill that was in the paper, um, I think up in, uh, around Dallas, up in um, Barron County. Uh, a sale bill, we've got um, a big sale coming up on April 10th. If you look down at the bottom here, it says if you have, I'm not going to read this whole thing. If you haven't heard, Dan, David, and Kayla Briel were involved in a terrible farm accident. Uh, basically, they were cleaning out, a they were um, scraping frozen silage from the sidewalls of an old tower silo, collapsed. Uh, dad and one of the two boys died in each other's arms. The third, the third person, the other son, managed to get out. But they were buried under about eight feet of, of, of frozen silage and obviously suffocated and died. And I don't know all of the details. We haven't done an investigation. But often, some of the farm injuries, some of these incidents, these terrible accidents and incidents that happen, happen when people are under stress. Epidemiologically, if you look at all the different risk factors, fatigue, fatigue is a big issue with, with all types of farm injuries. And so there's a lot of relationships. I would like for you to just take, um, and by the way, I'm not keeping close enough track of time. Could you kind of give me like about a 10 minute warning? Is your, okay, I need a little bit of time. I only need to prepare for being jerked off the stage. I would like to free just take 10 awkward seconds of time. I'm good, really good at waiting, by the way. And, and, t and think about one thing that has stressed you out in the last, say, several weeks or several months. It could even be like the last couple years. So just, if you, if you want to close your eyes, think about like in your mind's eye, like, what, what did that scene look like? How did it feel? Did you have sensations you felt maybe in your stomach or your skin? And, and maybe some of those sensations and feelings come back today. Anybody like to uh, volunteer? Kind of help me out here a little bit? I know you need to be brave to do this. Yes. Yeah. So how did you feel like, did you know, did you go out and like look at the envelope in the mail or uh, did it get? It was on an email and I had to read it three times to make sure I wasn't just. So, so what, that's, a good, that's a good example. So you probably did tons of hours and hours of studying or weeks and weeks or whatever. So how did, what were some of those feelings you had? Uh, just overjoyed, excited, thrilled. How about before you knew? How about, the, how about some of the uh, uh, anxious uh, moments? Yeah, people have that sensation. People say, oh, I'm, I'm so anxious about things. I feel like I'm going to crawl out of my skin. There's just, you, you, if I got that email, I'd be afraid to open it probably. My heart rate would probably go up. Um, my, my little quick example, I know we have one person in the audience here who knows a little bit about this story. I have um, two adult children now. One of them is uh, 22, actually just turned 22, and the other one turns 25 shortly. 
Um, my 20, my 22 year old, about four years ago, at that time, you can do the math, he was 18, we were just finishing up high school. Um, things were interesting as they are with a lot of um, 18, 17 and 18 year old young men. And I, in, in the middle of the evening, I woke up at about three, it was exactly 3.20 in the morning. I got up, as a lot of guys my age do, got up, use the restroom, get back into bed. My bed, my side of the bed is actually about four or five feet from the window blinds right next to me. We're two stories up. And I looked over at those aluminum slatted window blinds and I noticed that there were like red flashing lights. And I thought, oh good, isn't this just a joy? Had to get up early the next morning and you know, when you've got adolescent young men at home, it's like, do we have the police? Anyway, I looked outside the window, his, um, Jack's car was on fire. He had flames shooting. This is an old Toyota Corolla. He had five foot flames that were coming up off of the hood. I knew that our house was at risk. We had people in the house. We, Got up. My wife was a saint. She just was so calm. She called 911. It took forever for the fire department to get there. But we got everybody out of the house. When I knew everybody was safe, I thought, yeah, but my, my uh, just newly, I had just leased a vehicle, a Ford Focus. It's the same one that's out there. I thought, oh, my, car, my car's going to go up in flames. So I climbed into the car. I often leave my keys in my car. They were not in there. But then I thought, I, I knew exactly where they were. I never can find my keys, but I knew exactly where they were. I went running through the yard. I felt like a superhuman. I was jumping over things. I had this sense of calm. But that was all the stress hormones. If you had measured my pulse, my pulse was probably 140, 150. Um, but I was able to get things done. And that's what we call, that's, that's acute stress. Uh, and that's not the type of stress, that is the kind of stress you probably got when the email showed, you, showed up with your CCA score, um, that short-term burst. For me, that was really a good thing. We got the car pulled out. Thank God the fire department pulled up because the siding on our garage and the front part of our house was starting to melt like wax. It was very scary, very, very acutely stressful time. The problem that we have, and by the way, this is like a primitive response. If you look at the uh, gazelle or the impala or whatever that is being chased by, anybody know what that animal is? Cheetah, the world's fastest mammal, can run like 75 miles an hour. That, that gazelle is probably a few years old, so he or she is like live to see another day, or will live in this video to see another day. I'm not going to show you the video. Because of the acute stress response. So it is something that is relatively positive. The problem is when you have this over and over and over again, that's when it becomes damaging. Let me just talk about this real fast. It's a, it's a chain of events that happen. We see something. We, I, I look out at the sl through the slats of the window. I see the fire. It's something that triggers one or more of our five senses. That triggers mechanisms in the brain. The hypothalamus, it drops in a little dose of chemical or a hormone, corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH. That tells your pituitary gland. You guys have heard the, of the pituitary, right? It's like the mass, it's a tiny little, it's like the size of a pea. And it's like the master gland, the super, it's like a conductor of an orchestra where all of the musicians are the different glands in your endocrine system. So the pituitary gland says, all right, we got, the mo we got the message here. Let's get everything kicked into gear. And it releases another hormone, a ACTH. And that goes actually physically into your bloodstream. And it triggers the adrenal glands. Anybody know where the adrenal glands are located? Those of you who know like physiology, like you know this, Matt, right? Where's your adrenal glands? Heather knows, right? Adrenal glands are located at the top of the kidneys. And so this takes just a matter of a few seconds and you've got all of a sudden the kidneys are told or the adrenal glands are told, start to just pump this out. We've got to get these hormones, we've got to get these chemicals flowing. And again, the two big ones that we worry about are cortisol and adrenaline. These are the chemicals that nature and evolution have given us to either fight off a threat. By the way, with Jack's car, you could see it was totally destroyed, but I was bound and determined once I got my car out of the driveway, which is kind of both fighting and fleeing, trying to get away. I was bound and determined I was going to put that dang fire out. 
So my neighbor brought over a little five pound ABC dry chemical fire extinguisher and I swear that fire laughed, <laughs> that fire laughed at me, like openly laughed at me like an evil, evil thing. So fight, flight, the other thing that happens in the presence of all of these chemicals that are flowing through and, and lodging in different parts of our brain or at least having an impact on parts of our brain is it can cause us to freeze. Literally to freeze in terms of our motion but also to freeze in terms of like decision making. You guys have all experienced this, right? Where suddenly something happens and you're being asked to make decisions or, Matt, I think about all the stuff we were dealing with yesterday during the Farm Technology Days board meeting. Like you've got all this adrenaline and cortisol going and sometimes you're just sort of incapacitated. The problem with that, if it's just for a few moments, you're gonna be fine. If that's something that's occurring time after time and you're incapacitated, you can't make decisions financially and it just becomes very difficult. So because the time is tight, I'm not going to go through all these. There's some obvious ones. Heart rate, blood pressure, our blood sugar level goes up. That's going to become important in a second. Pupils dilate to bring in more information. Our digestive system and our reproductive system kind of like goes, it kind of goes on vacation. If you think about the... Um, are we still recording on TV? If you, if, you think about, if you think about your reproductive and digestive system, that takes a lot of energy. And so the last thing that little deer or that little impala thing, it's not thinking about reproducing or, or sex or anything like that. It's just thinking about getting the heck out of there. So again, this is kind of a natural way that we have evolved. Our fear center is stimulated. So when I think back to that fire and like having this sort of evil laugh, part of that is because we have these really emotional things that happen because of certain changes that happen in our brain. I'll come back. But again, really super critical, higher level thinking becomes really difficult. Being able to make decisions, being able to think about the future becomes almost impossible. Um, because time is tight, this question, is this response, is it good or is it bad? It depends. I mean, if you're, the cheat, if you're the little deer being chased by the cheetah, it's a good thing. We do need stress. The gazelle needed stress. Stress helps us grow as people. Um, so stress is not bad. Stress helps us get from third grade to fourth grade. We have stress in getting married in having children, in being a child, in, in maybe changing jobs, um, in growing older, and also in being, in being young as well. So stress is part of our everyday lives. The idea here is we should not be like running away or doing everything we can do to avoid stress because that's not healthy. And again, I'll come back to that in, in, in a few minutes here. Um, Richard, because time is a little bit crunched, what I want to do, rather than going all the way through this case study, for those of you who are with the different agencies, again, the Farm Medicine Center, um, some of the other groups who are represented here, and, and for everybody else, I have put together a case study. I worked with the Farm Center, with Frank Fryer, um, Kathy Schmidt a little bit, um, Joy Kirkpatrick at the Center for Dairy Profitability. And we put together a case study. This is also based on some of the cases I was involved with in Minnesota a couple decades ago. So probably about 12 different families are represented in this case study. And the idea of the case study, it kind of walks you through a two or, three, two or three day period in the life of a farm family. The idea of this, and you know, if we had an extra half hour or so, is to kind of walk through this and when you see another family and kind of what they're going through, it helps you to better recognize some of the signs and symptoms and, and impacts of stress. So in this family, we've got some health concerns that happen. We have multiple generations. We have a young couple. They're expecting children. We also know that un, unborn children are affected by high levels of stress in different ways. So I would encourage you to have a look at this. Maybe at the end, if we have just a few more minutes, we can we can chat briefly about this publication. Um, I, I do want to say also, I've kind of made this clear, but I've, had, I've done this several times. Probably, this is probably the 10th or 15th time. And I've had families read this and say, you got to take us out of there. And it's like, no, that, that's not, this is not about your family. Um, there, it, this is really an amalgamation of cases, I will give you one exception. There is a little scene at the very, kind of like a theatrical scene at the very end 
where the young couple is out in the dairy barn after they've had a really tough and difficult day and they kind of stop what they're doing and they dance together. And that's actually based on a story that a young couple told me about up in uh, Barron County about this time last year. So, and she's given me permission to use this and she actually reviewed my, it's Brittany Olson up in Barron County. Okay, so that's, that is the case study. Um, again, lots of things that you could talk about if you would like to go through this. I wanna shift gears a little bit. So that's largely acute stress, the, the like short term, you got the burst of energy, all the things that happen. But again, from a health perspective, if you look at the safety and injury issues, our big issue is chronic stress. Like long term, things that end up resulting in depression and other sorts of issues. So I wanna, I wanna go through this in a little bit of detail. I talked about, the, remember the hypothalamus, it's, it like integrates your sense of sight and hearing and it was my hypothalamus that triggered this reaction when I was running around like a finely conditioned athlete and had all the decision making capabilities of Aaron Rodgers, that was because of my hypothalamus had kicked everything into gear. Um, the other things I wanted to mention, the prefrontal cortex, that's the frontal part of our brain. That's kind of what makes us people versus animals. Our prefrontal cortex in human beings is kind of big and overdeveloped. It's the brain's um, decision-making center. It's the part of our brain that's like a mental scratch pad. So if we want to call forward information and do planning and think about the future and develop a, a cash flow for a, maybe a, a business venture or we're going to make some changes, that prefrontal cortex is really super critical. The prefrontal cortex also in young people, if you're an adolescent and you're between say, well, any child up through adolescence, it's the last part of your brain to develop. And so, if anybody here have adolescents at home? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. It's the last part of your brain to develop. That's why adolescents are, are who they are, because they have not developed all of those capacities to make smart decisions and to, and to weigh certain things. Um, just quickly, the hippocampus is long-term memory. Uh, people who develop Alzheimer's disease, oftentimes you can see it in some of the slides and things that they take from the hippocampus or imaging that they take of the hippocampus. So long-term memory. And the other one, when I talked about cementing these very emotional memories, it, that's the amygdala. The amygdala gets really like overactive and hyperactive when things get really stressful. And so that's why people begin to develop anxiety and um, some of the other things that occur. So, so what happens, so this, this is a lot of detail on the brain, so what, what happens? Remember, you've got cortisol and adrenaline when you've got the fire out in the barn or out in my driveway or you're the cheetah or the uh, gazelle being chased by the cheetah. The good thing about that reaction is our brain also has a thermostat. So, if you've got, we, yeah, we certainly have a thermostat in this room. It's back there. So what's a, what is a thermostat looking for? It's always like looking for some variable. What's, the, what's a thermostat looking for? Temperature or heat energy in the air, or if you want to go like to the micro, that's like the air molecules are moving faster and it sensed as heat. And if it sees like, okay, there's enough heat in the room, sends a signal to the furnace and says, okay, you can back her down a little bit, right? So our brain has a thermostat. The thermostat is in, in again, inside of the brain. It's in these different components. And the thermostat is little sensors or receptors in the brain that lock on to the cortisol and say, okay, we've got cortisol, everything's good. Start to crank the furnace back down. Start to crank down that reaction, that HPA axis. And those, those um, sensors, those little patches of, think of them as like little patches of Velcro that have an affinity for cortisol. They're packed in the prefrontal cortex, in the hippocampus, that's the memory part of our brain, and some of, some of the other parts. The problem is, if you take that thermostat and you cycle it and cycle it and you, you're constantly raising the temperature, lowering the temperature, eventually that mechanism begins to become less effective. It doesn't react as quickly, it becomes slower, and this is really crucial, there are parts of your brain 
that began to shrink. It's very, it's very small, but it is measurable. And if you're shrinking like the hippocampus as an example, and it's loaded with these receptors, you don't, your thermostat is not going to be as effective. And so that's when people begin to develop this notion of chronic stress. Because of the repeated exposure to these little events, and depending on how we react to those and what our resilience levels, there's a whole bunch of different factors, but that's when be people begin to develop chronic stress. The problem with chronic stress is, okay, now you got all this cortisol, it's hard to like control it, and it's locking into that frontal part of the brain, and it's really hard to make those decisions and to think clearly because you've got more of it happening, and so what happens to your decision making then? It starts, you don't make really great decisions, and if those have negative consequences, which they often do, and that's when things begin to kind of cycle out of control. And you throw into that when your prefrontal cortex isn't quite working right, your communication is kind of pretty, you guys all know this, right? Your communication gets kind of nasty and not very, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The amygdala takes over and that's the really emotional part. So that's why sometimes I get really crabby with my wife when I've got a lot of stress going on. It's because of, of these cycles and these things that happen. So there are, there are seven impacts. Talk about them really quickly. Physical health. So in the case study, we have issues connected to like heart disease or, or potential heart impacts. So Obviously, all this cortisol and adrenaline is going to increase blood pressure. Blood pressure is a known risk factor for a heart attack or for a stroke. Um, cholesterol levels change. The ratio between the bad cholesterol and the good cholesterol becomes less positive. Um, you think about that like if you get, if you're a caveman a million years ago and you got clawed by a saber-toothed tiger, you're under a lot of stress. It's actually better if your blood clots more quickly. So evolutionary. Uh, evolution has given us some of these things that aren't necessarily positives. Um, so yeah, blood pressure, um, uh, our LDL levels increase. The other thing that we see is besides heart and lung issues, infection. So people who develop uh, a lot of long-term chronic stress, they're going to be sick more often. Um, I often thought that we were always sick when we had young children because they were in daycare. A lot. However, when our kids weren't in daycare, we were sick a lot then too, and I think part of it was just lack of sleep and just a lot of stress during those first few years. Um, and the other one is diabetes. So if you've got tons of, of blood sugar, because you're constantly under stress, your risk of diabetes goes up as the pancreas begins to change and the mechanisms for regulating blood sugar change. <clears throat> Again, there is a negative impact on decision making, distraction, and memory. And also our fear and anxiety tend to go up with more and more stress. Um, I'll, I'll skip this. With more and more stress, so this is that prefrontal cortex, that frontal part of the brain. If you look at control, little stress, uh, with lots of stress, the prefrontal cortex, uh, brain cells, don't they begin to get paired off and pruned. Like, it's like you went in with pruning shears and pruned them away. And so that's not a positive thing. So, so your decision-making ability is going to diminish, which then affects your resilience and things. However, you can't really see this really well here, but this is the amygdala. It's like, it's like cortisol feeds the amygdala. And the amyg amygdala actually grows stronger and thicker. Like literally, the cells get stronger and thicker. So that's why. You're going to worry more. You're going to be more anxious. And, and again, it's because of these direct chemical, chemical impacts. So that also affects learning and resilience, as I talked about. Another way to look at this is if you are not stressed, or if, you ha if you're stressed. So there, again, there's no such thing as no stress, unless you're dead, I suppose, or in a coma, although that's also stressful on parts of your body. But under normal conditions, when stress is right-sized, the front part or the top part of your brain is in control. So it's like we all have all of our crap. We have our crap together. We have everything in order, the frontal part. It's like the brain has a CEO, and the CEO is competent and can make decisions. However, in the presence of chronic stress, that flips upside down. And this more primitive, amygdala-driven part of the brain becomes more powerful. So 
yet another way to look at this is this is sort of the adult brain and this is sort of, oops, and the other one is sort of the adolescent 17 year old that's having girlfriend and boyfriend problems and everything is an issue and a problem and you're having trouble communicating with your parents. This is, again, this is kind of what happens as a part of that stress response. So any, um, I'll, I'll stop for just a second. Addiction behaviors, so when we talk about opioids, heroin addiction, yeah, oftentimes very directly connected to stress or pain because a lot of times people find that as a, a kind of an, ent an entry point because they've been dealing with pain or because they simply want to numb this pain of stress. However, the, so we hear a lot about opioids and heroin. However, the, the big one in the agricultural community is alcohol. And again, the same types of issues. Again, feeds on itself. You, you, you use a substance or you abuse a substance. Yes, it numbs that sort of feeling and that fear, that anxiety. But then decisions get worse. Learning gets worse. Resilience gets worse. And it, be it becomes that vicious cycle that we talked about. Communication and so social support systems. Again, this is where I saw my family, my mom and dad, I did not realize it at the time. I thought that's just what every couple did, but they stayed close together. They stayed in sync. I think it was very helpful that they had the three little girls at home, and my parents were such good role models, so I'm grateful for that now. But, but the opposite oftentimes happens, and, and that's why it's important to, to think about how you can continue to keep a couple or a family kind of working together, even though it's very difficult. So that's, um, how am I doing on time? Tell me how much, can you tell me what I got left? 10.15. Okay, I'm gonna take the 15. So, uh, so like where do we go, f like where do we, I'm gonna take control. <laughs> so I'll go till 10 after. When you see the, <coughs> so the question is, okay, so what? Like there's, you've given us a ton of stuff and you know, we're not a gazelle, we're not a cheetah. So where do we go with all this stuff? How do we begin to like, wh like where's the lever, going back to the throttle or the levers for the fountain, how do we turn it down? So the first idea, super important, is control. Um, I usually go into this whole thing, I, I have to, I'm a control guy. I like to have control. And I don't mean control over other people, but I like to have control over situations. I like to be able to see the future and kind of know where I'm going. These people that can get in a vehicle and just take off for a, a road trip and not where they're going, I, I cannot do that. But control is known absolutely for sure to be a critical part of kind of turning down that, that cortisol fountain. So, a little bit complicated, but I'll talk about this like tr this very um, uh, his historical or like revolutionary set of experiments that was done back in the 50s and 60s, where they looked at rats. Anybody has anybody ever had like pet rats? But you guys are a lot of you are from farms. You don't have pet rats, right? So rats in a laboratory will typically live, if they're healthy, between two and four years. So they had a group of very healthy, these are the control rats that are in a laboratory. And then they had these other two poor groups of rats. They're, instead of just two of them, there's like 50. So you had like replications of this experiment. And both of these groups of rats, the executive rats and the subordinate rats, about every hour they would be subjected to one to three shocks for an hour. So we're talking like high voltage, not enough amps to kill the rat, but a high voltage, what, ha what happens when you get a high voltage shock? It hurts, it's very startling, it's, it's not pleasant. You know, it could actually, if you sh shock somebody with a cattle prod, you can get a welt from it. Um, so they were both subjected to a few shocks an hour and very random and very unpredictable. The difference between the executive rat and the subordinate rat is the executive rat had a little paddle in front of them and they would see a light. The light would come on and they could reach out and push the paddle and about 25% of the time the shock wouldn't be, they wouldn't be subjected to the shock. And by the way, they also turned down the subordinate rats 
th this guy wasn't shocked here, but he had no control. It was the executive controlling the subordinate. But they could, they could turn down. They had just a tiny bit of control. They could only control the situation 25% of the time. Which group of rats do you think lived the longest life? The control and executive, almost identical. Even though that executive rat, in 75% of the times, he was supposed to get shocked, he was still getting shocked. That 25% of the time, he could still turn the shock off. The rat that had no control, that just this was just happening at random intervals and had zero control, dies early. We're talking within a period of months. If you, do a di uh, uh, if you would dissect that rat afterwards, I always forget the name of, what's a animal dissection or a, ne what is it? Necropsy. Ne necropsy, yeah. If you, do the, if you do that to that middle rat, their stomachs are going to, their intestinal tracts and stomachs are going to be full of ulcers. They're going to die early. Parts of their brain are going to actually begin to deteriorate. So control, even a little bit of control is huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, I got to get rid of that controller. Speaking of control. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but the idea is how do you wrestle back? How do you, people, how do you get people back some sense of control? It is absolutely critical. Um, I'll come back and talk more about that in just a second. Here's another one I want to just throw out there to you. Uh, absolutely fantastic TED talk by a lady named Kelly McGonigal. And Mike and others, I'm happy to share my PowerPoints with you guys. This has been viewed now about 20 million times. She basically says, we're all going to have stress in our lives, but the people who are able to cope with it the best are the people that see stress as a signal to change. If, if you view stress as it's a sign for me to change, it's a sign for me to begin to connect and coalesce with my resources, uh, with my loved ones, with my family. Um, in her talk, again, because we're so limited on time, she actually goes through a study of 30,000 adults, and she basically shows with data that people who have a lot of stress but view it as a sign to action and to connect with other loved ones and people, they're not negatively affected. They maintain that ability to make decisions. They maintain their health. So again, those of you who are epidemiology type people, Josie, I'm thinking about you. Like a really, a really, really cool study here if anybody wants more detail. And it's in Health Psychology from 2012. So again, uh, it should, stress should be viewed as a call to reach out to build relationships, personal networks with family, loved ones, and community. And again, through data, that has been shown to work and to be protective. Um, uh, let, me, let me point you to another resource in your packet, this uh, top 10 list. So this is something that kind of resulted from the work with, with the Farm Center, with Mike's group, and Frank Fryer, and other veterans. Like, like how do you start to take control back? Okay. So I'm not going to go through all these because time simply will not allow it. But there's a few things. Number three on here is, um, well, let me start with number two. Number two is to, s is it okay if I move up just a little bit? So number two is about like writing things down. And if you're, like if you guys are, you're FSA, right? Like not writing it down for other people, but when people come into your office or you sit down at a kitchen table or you're even on the phone to say, can you grab a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil? I want you to write a few things down. That action of writing things down and seeing it on paper in your handwriting in front of you, that has value. There's actually been a whole bunch of studies done with college students that say that, I'm left-handed, so um, that physical action of brain to hand onto paper makes a difference. The number three there is about SMART goals. So setting goals that are SMART, meaning Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-based. Um, a lot of times we write, we do checklists. Everybody, like, as a control guy, I wake up every Monday morning and I've got to have a checklist. But your checklist really ought to ha say, okay, what, like, what is the order of priority? Like, specifically, what do I have to get done? Um, and like, what's my, what's a time frame for doing this? For a lot of people, Mike, I'm guessing when you guys take the phone calls, it's, it's getting people to take those first few steps. 
and it, it might be that they have to call an accountant or sit down with a local person from the technical college and maybe think through some options. With a lot of people, you only have a couple of options. You either need to make more money or you need to cut your costs, but there's a, often a myriad of different ways to think about how you might do that. So SMART goals, really important. Um, uh, number nine is about follow-up, uh, making sure you do check back in with people. <clears throat> I'm skipping around here a little bit. Number seven is to make sure you connect with people who have the appropriate levels of expertise. So I'm a big advocate for working with people in, in the health professions because a lot of times um, decision making and stress and family relationships and being able to, to deal with some of the stress, it's often connected to personal health, physical health. So making sure you're partnering with like a primary health professional, a nurse practitioner, doctor, clinic system, that sort of thing. So this is in your packet for your further perusal and use. The other piece has a lot on like specific like health and stress related behaviors. I have five minutes, right? I have five, five left. All right. So, so let me just talk about, let me talk about a couple of these. Exercise, it's kind of a big deal. Um, Exercise helps with the release of natural endorphins and other chemicals that strengthens your heart, your respiratory system. Your brain uses a ton of energy. Your brain uses a fifth of all the energy. It's only like th three pounds. Your brain is pretty small relative to the rest of your body, but it uses a fifth of the energy. And exercise not only helps with heart and lung conditioning, but it also helps with brain conditioning. And exercise promotes the growth in the parts of your brain that has all, all these little chunks of Velcro that are supposed to grab onto cortisol. There's actually, again, brain imaging that shows, I don't have time for this whole thing, but if you exercise regularly with mild aerobic exercise, you actually see measurable increases in the brain volume of the hippocampus, which is, again, the part that has all those Velcro receptors in it. Cortisol receptors that are like Velcro, little chunks of Velcro. Meditation and mindfulness, I think this is an area that's going to get a lot more resource, research in the future. It does a whole bunch of positive things. It increases the hippocampus, which has got the receptors. It diminishes the influence of the amygdala, that's the worry center, that bottom part of the brain that gets overactive and creates anxiety. So here's, this is almost my last slide. When <clears throat> I have shown this, and I, back when, about April or March last year, I would talk about like, you can get apps that help you meditate and do mindfulness exercises. And I had a lot of guys, I'm just gonna name it, these were entirely men who said, I'm not gonna do that. I actually had a guy in, I had a guy in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, who said, I'm never gonna go out and buy a yoga mat. Like, I'm not, I never told you to buy a yoga mat. But what I would argue is, why do we do this? Come fall, you know, half of the state of Wisconsin in that first day of deer season is sitting out for four hours. Dave, I know you do this, right? You sit out in a tree stand, and I've even heard men and women who have said, and I kind of hope, like, I don't care if I see a deer or not. It's the same way when I float down the Wisconsin River in my canoe with my fishing pole over, sometimes it's like, ah, I'm just going to reel it in close to the canoe because I don't want a fish bugging me and I don't want to get snagged. And I, I think that that's what this is about. We know that it works, we know that it helps, and there's data to show it. Counseling, Mike talked about counseling, potentially extremely positive. You can reinforce these positive changes, accountability, follow through. Don't do it alone. All this takes time. I mentioned a team approach, really, really crucial. Encouraging people to reach out and connect with other resources. I think this is the beauty of extension. Several of our extension people in this room, these guys are really good at helping people connect with the different resources that they might not have thought about. Again, our technical college system I know does that super well. Um, also be thinking about your stress and well-being. This stuff applies um, totally to you. Here's my conclusion. Um, and again, helping people help themselves takes time, patience, multiple approaches. 
And a big part of this is how we view it. Do we view it as a call for change, as a call for action? If we do that, what are some positive things we can do to kind of take control? And that's how we begin to kind of claw through this. It's not easy. I'm not suggesting that in any way. But these are hopefully some strategies and some ways you can kind of find those levers to make a difference. Questions? I got one minute for questions. Mike. John, you mentioned the meditation and mindfulness and such. Uh, has it, I guess, uh, for some people, prayer? Would prayer fall underneath that? Be another you yeah. That? Yeah, and so a lot of the stuff that's been done with meditation and mindfulness, it, in many cases, also connects to spiritu spirituality, to um, gratitude, to prayer. Um, there's definitely research that shows that being connected to some type of religious institution, um, formally or informally, is protective with stress. So yeah, con encouraging people to connect with church, with clergy. One other thing, that's also a risk factor. Like if you're out in a community and you suddenly hear, yeah, he's been going to church for as long as I've known him as a little boy and they just haven't been here lately, that's probably when you need to maybe think a little bit more about providing people with some help. Anything else? It's a great question. Thank you. Ken? John, I just wanted to point out, I know you had put a lot of effort into um, your uh, safety and health information website, the agsafety.info website. Yeah. And a lot of current, some of the things you were mentioning today is in there. So on the back of that, the, the card that's in there, um, that website is in there along with other resources. Yeah, so, th so this one is out there. And then also on the just purely occupational health and safety side, we also do have, if you search Wisconsin Agricultural Safety and Health, there's some stuff there. What I tried to do with this, Ken, is to get everything that I've talked about today, including a lot of the references and resources on like a one-stop shopping center. And I thought that this probably would be the best place to go for that. But I don't want to discount the work Cheryl and I have done, Cheryl especially with the uh, Ag Safety site. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Richard, for inviting me to come up for this. I appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you for coming. Is there any other questions for John before he's done? Are you going to be sticking around? I'll stay, yeah, I'll stay around. Okay. I didn't know if you had to leave right away or not. So just to tie into that a little bit, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not trying to. Actually, my mother's family is from Indiana also. Oh. And I think you and I talked about that at New College. That, that's been a couple years ago. So were you, what, what part of it? <coughs> Womansport. Yeah. I remember you and I that. talked about it. I remember that. Yeah. So both of us got a little hoosier in us. But don't hold it against us, OK? So with that, and I just wanted to share something. Amanda brought up something. Now there is the, the negative to um, her reaction to passing that exam when she almost sure. choked me to death. Oh. <laughs> because I had been Dude, trying to work with her son to get her through some rough spots on that CCA test. So that's the other, you know, big, that exaltation. Excited. Yeah. Overly excited. <laughs> you were overly excited. I will agree with that because you both passed me out when you started hugging. <laughs> <laughs> So with that, we're going to be bringing Melissa up next. So we'll just take a quick, again, short minute, a few minute breaks. That looks good. And then we'll come back. Again, if you have questions, please 